Originally, we sailed from Broome north to the Lassipede Islands, and then on to the Sunday Islands in King Sound. Now we're heading for the tidal gorges of Talbot Bay, then on to Walcott Inlet to unload the Hufflinger. Further north to Curie Bay, and finally to Australia's last frontier, the Prince Regent River. By the following afternoon, we anchor in the shelter of Talbot Bay. The mangrove-lined shore indicates that this is an ideal spot to hunt with our spears and woomeras. We learnt this skill in Arnhem Land during the making of our film Across the Top. As the tide drops, schools of fish swim out from the mangroves towards the open sea. Hunting these fish with spear and woomera takes skill and practice, but it's one of the most satisfying sports we know. I learned how to kill fish this way from the Pacific Islanders when I was a boy. With a whip of the spear, Dave nails a mullet, a perfect throw. I got these two with one shot. Spearing fish is good fun until you lacerate your foot hundreds of miles from the nearest doctor. I accidentally jumped on a razor-sharp clam. The first job is to dig out all the splintered shell before it festers. We always carry surgical needles and catgut for emergencies like this, and it's Dave's job to stitch it up. Hercules is upset by my groans and breaks up the surgery to console me. With the tough skin from months of going barefoot and no anaesthetic, the job is pretty difficult, but Dave manages to get a few stitches in. Travelling to the end of Talbot Bay, we pass through the most exciting and spectacular scenery. This wild country is typical of the terrain all along the coast. Ahead is a narrow gap through the cliff, and some 500 yards further on, another gap only half as wide. We take a calculated risk and motor through. It's treacherous, and for a moment we doubt our judgment. We've made it through the first entrance, but as we approach the second gap, it's a different story. The tide is charging through with incredible force. With all our camera gear in the boat, we dare not risk going on. Endlessly, the tide roars in and out between the high walls. The government has carried out a feasibility survey on the possibility of producing tidal power here in the future. And the amazing thing is the eight-foot drop in water level between the two bays. Never have we seen such an impressive sight as these tidal gorges. 
But now, back to the lugger to catch the tide. After travelling for 30 miles, we reach a small creek where we can beach the lugger. This is a very tricky manoeuvre. We have to judge the speed of the lugger correctly and run it into the soft, muddy bank at just the correct angle. As soon as we ram the edge, we work quickly, getting all the weight over to the port side so that the lugger will lie in towards the bank as the tide recedes. We use all the ropes and anchors we can lay our hands on to hold us as the water drops, even running ropes from the masts out to the mangroves. And it's off with the Hufflinger before any problems arise. Dave, rather optimistically, goes down to check the rear bearings. The dogs and I run out more ropes to stop the lugger shifting with the incoming tide. But Boss Dog deserts the team in disgust. And I don't blame him. It's a bad job under these conditions. Meanwhile, Dave's out on an exploratory trip into the interior. Without a doubt, this would be the first time a vehicle has ever been in this part of Australia. These wide salt plains that flood with the spring tides would be an obstacle to almost any other vehicle, but the little Hufflinger churns across with ease. The following morning we go back to some country Dave says shows promise. We're after copper and quartz crystals in particular. These crystals are worth good money if a commercial scene is found. A scorpion, venomous but not deadly, it can inflict an agonizing sting. But nature's evenly balanced. It crawls too close to a meat ant's nest, and instantly they swarm out and attack with deadly fury. The scorpion is dead within seconds and will be dragged into the underground chambers as food for the colony. Back towards the coast, small saltwater crocodiles struggle to survive. They disappear without a ripple on the surface of the water. As I mentioned earlier, crocodiles are now protected and we spend considerable time surveying each river, counting the crocodiles and checking to see if any are breeding.
a percentage are caught, measured and released. From these observations, we're able to estimate the numbers of crocs and their age in each river. All information is sent back to the Fisheries and Fauna Department in Western Australia. It's pleasing to find small pockets of crocs. It means that their numbers are increasing again. The law banning the shooting of crocodiles was passed just in time. Stay long. If we don't get the Hufflinger back on board now, we'll be caught by the neap tides and may not be able to move for two weeks. Out in the open sea again, we push through the swirling currents to Curie Bay, the cultured pearl farm. Curie Bay is the only settlement on the coast, and it's here solely for the production of cultured pearls. All the work is carried out on huge floating rafts. We're fortunate in arriving during the annual pearl harvest. The baskets of shell are hung in the sea for three years, and once they're brought to the surface, they're quickly moved to the technician's section. A wedge holds the shell partially open, ready for the operation. The technicians are highly skilled operators from Japan, and until recently, the seeding of cultured pearls was a closely guarded secret, and this film would have been impossible to obtain. Intensely interested, we watch Yamamoto, the chief technician. These oysters are being reseeded. This is a new development whereby two pearls are grown in the life of the oyster. Yamamoto uses a long scalpel to insert a cut in the body of the oyster. Into this is placed the nucleus for a new pearl. During the next three years, the oyster will coat the nucleus with a substance known as nacre. Layers of nacre form the pearl. The technicians work swiftly, completely absorbed in their work. As each operation is completed, the previous cultured pearl is removed. Due to the size of Australian oysters and the ideal conditions, these cultured pearls are the biggest and best in the world. They command the highest prices, the best pearls selling for enormous amounts. A United States jeweler sold a magnificent gem for a record $70,000. So from the humble oyster has risen a multi-million dollar industry. We sit with Yamamoto inspecting the last hour's work and we can't help wondering just where these lovely gems will finish up. We leave these industrious men and look for a safe anchorage before nightfall. We are sailing into the heart of Australia's unknown, the mighty Prince Regent River. It's a fight all the way. We're pushing against an almost impossible tide. At one stage, we're even going backwards, although the engine is running at maximum revs and all sails are up. All the time, we check the depth. Not even Juby has been up this river. And what wild, beautiful, lonely country it is. Swinging into a small creek, we see our goal, 
a magnificent waterfall still flowing at the end of the dry season. On the high tide, we find we can tie up right under the cascades. The next hours are some of the most peaceful of the whole trip. What a glorious spot, green and lush after miles of stark, hungry hills. Cool water, so refreshing after weeks of washing in the sea. Pure fresh water for a cup of coffee. It's a luxury in these parts. but the tides control our movements, and in the early hours of the morning, we head once more for the open sea. One and a half million acres of this region have been declared a flora and fauna reserve. It's also a reserve for Aborigines, so permits must be obtained before entry. Little is known of the flora and fauna. The whole area must be one of Australia's outstanding natural assets. It could become a national park of great importance, providing, of course, that man, progress and pollution are controlled. From here, we start our southward journey, slowly heading back to Broome. Now we're keen to see what's beyond the coastline. The whole Kimberley area has become a real challenge. Fifty miles down the coast, a flock of terns swoop across our bow. This means fish and big ones too, so it's into them. For better sport, I prefer game tackle, and right away, I have a strike. A nice trevally puts up a terrific fight, and no wonder, I've hooked him through the gills. How's this for a fisherman's delight? Giant tarum racing for the lure. Dave hooks one, and a pack of sharks arrive, and a feeding frenzy begins right before our eyes, like piranha in the Amazon. They rip into the fish and tear it to pieces in seconds, the blood in the water triggering more and more sharks to the attack. To get away from the sharks, we troll out into the open water and catch some magnificent Spanish mackerel.
Dave gets a strike, cuts the motor and plays it in. Now I've hooked one. Dave's fish is a superb specimen, weighing over 50 pounds. On the light tackle, I have to play the fish cautiously. More sharks appear, bronze whalers this time. One of them even strikes at our plastic lure. By the time I land my last fish, the sharks are a nuisance again, so it's back to the lugger after a great morning. We eat these fish fried, stewed and curried. They're good eating and free from bones. A 54 pounder cleaned. By midday we reach their island and it's a solemn, sincere farewell as we part company. Tom is staying with us until we reach Broome. The Bardi people settle back into their beloved islands and we head south non-stop. We waste little time unloading and preparing for our trip north. The end of the dry season is near and we've got a lot of country to cover yet. We'll carry only the bare essentials now, leaving our big boat and all excess gear behind. Towing the Hufflinger in the trailer will save petrol until we reach the really mountainous country. But we can't go without Wati Nerdu of the Warora tribe. Wati now lives at Maumjum Mission near Derby, but his tribal country is over the King Leopold Ranges, 300 miles away. We load on his spears and swag and get moving over the rugged Kimberley Ranges, following the beef road for 200 miles. After leaving Broome, we drove to Derby, unloaded our gear, picked up Watty and continued up the beef road. Now from Gibb River Station, we'll head straight into the bush, 150 miles overland to within 30 miles of where we offloaded the Hufflinger from the lugger. It's back to Derby then and along the Northern Highway to the new Ord River Dam. At Gibb River Station we find Watty's tribal relatives. We ask if anyone's been out in the back country recently. Only stockmen or horses will get through, they say. The country's too rough for motor vehicles. But we're determined to see more of this forgotten land and we leave Gibb River behind and begin the most rugged and exhausting trip of our lives.
the wet season build-up threatens as we cross the headwaters of the Drysdale River, the locals call this time of year the suicide month. The temperature regularly reaches 40 degrees and the intense humidity makes life unbearable. The going gets really tough. So we offload the Hufflinger, ready to continue in convoy. Nearing his tribal country, Watty becomes increasingly exuberant. That's where we have to go, he says. Over that range, and the next, and the next. As the days go by, we crash through the roughest country in Australia. The vehicles take a terrible pounding, and at the end of each day, we're all physically exhausted. Man, this bull really has a complaint about life. Roped and dehorned by native stockmen only recently, it's taken to the hills to escape human interference. Citing our vehicles, he takes revenge. Then satisfied, lets us pass. At last we succeed in crossing the mountains and move down onto the plains beyond, heading for our destination, Munja. This settlement was established to make contact with and pacify the fierce Kimberley tribes. But it was abandoned in the early 40s and the Aborigines moved to missions along the coast. Watty lived here as a boy, and it's an emotional experience for him to walk around the ruins with visions of the past returning. little remains of the baker's oven or anything else for that matter I remember that teapot says Watty and he explains how they used this old corn grinder to make flour Watty tells us that supplies from Derby were brought up the river on luggers at high tide and unloaded right beside the settlement. And this river, the Calder, flows into Walcott Inlet only 30 miles from where we unloaded the Hufflinger two months ago. In the morning, Watty is noticeably quiet. It's the lost tribes, he says. All our people have left their country. They're either dead now or they live in the towns. Someday, he says, I'll come back with my family. Continuing along the plains, we come across extensive bird colonies. Nowhere else in Australia have we seen such numbers, so unconcerned about our presence. In fact, they all ignored me when I put up a hide to film them. continue to fly in from their feeding grounds further afield.
this male shows great affection for his mate and jealously keeps his rivals at bay. This is the extraordinary dance sequence that has made the Brolga so famous today. After they kiss, she literally flips. He loves me. He loves me. He really loves me. Meanwhile, Dave and Watty establish camp. What he breaks sticks the easy way. Wet season storms loom ominously. Here we are, 150 miles from the road, and the first of the monsoons is brewing. We find out later that this is the beginning of Cyclone Sally, which devastated the country further to the east around the Ord River. Worried and miserable, we pack up our gear and begin the long, arduous journey back to the trailer, knowing full well that we might not make it. It rains for two days and the situation is desperate. Then the storms finish and the skies clear. But the low country is now flooded and it's hard going. There's no way round, so it's straight through the middle. Dave organises the winch and uses the hand attachment to get us through. Hercules enjoys the cool break, but Boss Dog hates that water. A hand winch is essential in water this deep. Once we have the Land Rover going, it's just a matter of getting the Hufflinger to the other side. By the time we have our vehicles going again and find a suitable camping spot, Watty returns with his favourite food, a large, fat kangaroo. Now he's really enjoying himself, out in his beloved country with an open fire cooking kangaroo tail. And the longer we stay in the wilderness, the more we learn from Watty. These water holes, common throughout the Kimberley, are rich in native food. Here we're collecting bulbs. Boiled for a few minutes, they're very nourishing.
On a rare stretch of plain, wallabies are plentiful. When Watty uses a rifle, it's for convenience. But when he's hunting with his spears, it's for the love of it. For Watty, these days are some of the happiest for many years. He prepares his hunting spear. Warming the beeswax, he rolls it around the steel head until it fits tightly into the shaft. And now the hunt is on. It takes him a few hours to regain his accuracy. But as the day progresses, his natural hunting ability returns. Wallabies, hiding in the long grass, are difficult to see. It's a long, hard chase, but once the wallaby tires, Watty is able to run it down. This is no emotionally charged issue. What he wanted food, so he kills with his spear, just as his ancestors did for thousands of years. Towards evening, he returns, tired but content. We always enjoy these warm nights camped in the bush. For Watty, this is one of the highlights of the trip. Fresh wallaby straight from the coals. With relief, we eventually reach our trailer again. After camping for the night, we press on, and Watty, with his usual good humour, moves rocks from our path as a symbolic gesture of our success. After driving 300 miles overland, we reach the beef road again. An incredible trip, one we'll never forget. Sadly, we drop Watty off, pick up our gear and make a dash along the highway to the Ord River Dam before the roads are cut. Fortunately, the rains have eased and we're able to reach the new Ord River Dam. Cyclone Sally partly filled the dam, and Operation Noah has begun. Operation Noah, organised by the Western Australian Wildlife Authority, commonly known by its initials Wawa, is a concentrated, determined effort to rescue all animals and reptiles as the dam fills. It's a two-year undertaking, and this is the first stage. The water will eventually cover 800 square miles in peak floods and 286 square miles under normal conditions. At present, the dam is a third full, and this is a lot of water to patrol. Many of the animals are strong swimmers and reach high ground, but a number, like this Euro, get into trouble. We work in closely with Wawa. This little chap, completely exhausted, offers no resistance.
Bert Lee and Bob Deere, members of Wawa, collect all wildlife after capture and release it again in pre-selected areas. And so the team helps to maintain the correct ecological balance in an area where this man-made stretch of water will bring immense changes. All day, every day, our patrols continue. We regularly visit Argyle Station, made famous by Mary Durack in her book, Kings in Grass Castles. This is the site of the original homestead. Cyclone Sally hit so quickly, the Argyle Plains flooded earlier than anticipated. The water rose 19 feet, and much valuable equipment was lost. Regardless of beauty or size, all animals and reptiles are collected and released. This blue-tongued lizard will eventually drown with exhaustion, but for Operation Noah. Some people have stated that the animal rescue is not worth all the effort, but we feel it is and it gives us all a great feeling of achievement to save even a humble lizard. Man built the dam and flooded the country, so it's only right that we should aid the creatures in distress. The completed dam will be a tremendous asset to Australia, not only economically, but also as a drought refuge for water birds. It's a conservationist's dream. Back at the camp, there's quiet excitement. Neville Beck has brought in a female nail-tail wallaby. This unique marsupial has a horny projection on the tip of its tail, and it has this distinctive rabbit-shaped head. It's believed to be the only female now in captivity, and it's hoped she'll mate with a male captured earlier. Along the way, we've lost the tops to our water bags, and have a constant frog problem. They get into our water bags to keep cool, and if you forget to check, you wind up with a mouthful of frogs. However, they're friendly little chaps and they don't mind being evicted. Harry Butler, the naturalist, is always busy. His job is to save the reptiles. This large, extremely dangerous king brown snake presents no problem to him. Meanwhile, I've rescued a large goanna, but it's not at all grateful. This tiny creature is a really exciting find. It's a rare Kimberley Planigale, the smallest marsupial in the world. It's not related to the mouse, but belongs to the same family as a spotted native cat, Tasmanian devil, and numbat. It feeds exclusively on insects. This is one of the few ever found. Truly a wonderful discovery, and such a delicate creature. Later, we found eight minute young in its tiny pouch. Regularly now, the intense monsoonal build-up fills the sky. Nightly, impressive electrical storms herald the oncoming wet. Everyone is anxious now. There's so much to do. But this character is pleased with the approaching rains and the promise of even more water. Concentrated efforts on each island produce good results. These goannas are hooded to keep them quiet. Is he happy now? His number one enemy, the goannas, are being removed from the scene. A helicopter is used to speed up the surveys and to muster the wild cattle from the newly formed islands. This is specialized work. 
the pilot hovering low over the trees until the cattle head for the open water. From here, Wawa boats move the cattle to the mainland. Then, there's an almost fatal disaster. Dave is gored by a wild rogue bull, and he's very lucky to be alive. The scrubber is immediately shot. Minutes before, this massive beast came out of the bush, charging Dave and carrying him for 15 feet before throwing him to the ground. He lay stunned, and just as the bull was going to gore him again, we arrived, saving Dave from almost certain death. He's still only semi-conscious. Our second camera is smashed, and Dave seems more concerned about this than his own well-being. Immediately, he's rushed to hospital. How he survived serious injury, we'll never know. For us, the journey is nearly over. Dave is able to move about again after hospital treatment, but he's in no condition to continue working. The rains are falling daily now in the catchment areas, so we pull out and head south before the monsoons isolate us completely. intermittent squalls and spectacular skies tell us the sun has gone now and the wet is truly here. It's the finish of one season, the beginning of another.